Since the beginning of time, mankind has been at war. Tribe killing tribe, family killing family, nation slaughtering nation, genocide mass scales. What drives humankind to such slaughter? This film is about examination of who we are as human beings and our vast, vast potential, what we might attain instead in life, rather than the primitive levels we've seen in the past. I'm Dr. Ron Dalrymple. In this film, we're going to talk about a whole new theory of mind called quantum field psychology. It integrates all prior theories of psychology under a new paradigm into the realm of hard science, a true mind shock to many people in the field. Is intuition real or imagined? Think about this. Have you ever been on a bus or in a store or on a plane? and you feel someone's eyes on you. You turn around and look directly at them, even a hundred yards away or more. How is that possible under the old rules of science? How could you feel that? How could you know they're there? Is telepathy possible or mere chimera, mere imagination? Or let's say you're thinking about a loved one or a friend and the phone rings and it's them on the phone or you get a letter in the mail from them. What if the mind is an energy field that transcends the physical brain? All of these strange occurrences happen to many people worldwide, yet science writes it off to coincidence because they have no paradigm to explain it with. Nikolai Tesla stated that all matter is light or energy and the mind is energy which lives beyond the physical body. Many statements made by Tesla parallel the major concepts of quantum field psychology. Professor Michael Tischer stated that mathematics is very, very important. It's the basic language of all sciences. It is really the first and most pure science there is. The second science is physics, or the direct application of mathematics to the physical world. He said it's great to see math and physics now applied to psychology. In the form of quantum field psychology, which is a new bridge between science and spirituality and integrates sciences with all the modern day psychologies as well as Eastern and Western philosophies. A whole new take on the nature of this world. Astounding. What is the greatest question mankind has? That question is, who are we? What are we? What are we doing here? What's our purpose in life? This theory is about how mind energy can be expressed through quantum physics and topological mathematics. Axiom one of quantum field psychology, parallel to Tesla, is that the mind is an energy field that transcends the physical brain. Thought emotion waves are generated by the mind as an interaction of biological, perceptual, memory, and abstracting processes. Thought emotion waves transcend and project beyond the human brain, generating its own pilot wave that travels through space. Each thought emotion wave is expressed as a Fourier wave, given the formula wavelength equals spatial frequency times amplitude times phase. This parallels de Broglie's 1900 concept that a pilot wave is attached to every particle of matter a theory quickly adopted by Einstein. Professor Michael Tescher of the University of Maryland stated that Dr. Ron Dalrymple is a leader of a whole new wave of thought, combining quantum physics with topological mathematics and all the major fields of psychology into a whole new paradigm of thought, which is shocking the scientific, psychiatric, and psychological worlds. You mentioned me on the phone the other day, people are waking up nationwide like nothing before and internationally. You know, one individual estimated there's 80 million people internationally who are now tuned in to the concept that there's a higher level consciousness now being discovered and experimented upon and examined by lots and lots of people worldwide. There's lots of interest about this. That's probably 10 years old. And then he estimated there were 50 million. So in 10 years, the numbers have grown and people are waking up. It has become part of the conscious conversation 
That's what Bruce Lipton says from um, Biology of Belief. Of course, you were in our class several years ago for quantum field psychology. Yes. It's been a real issue with me. I had an epiphany when I was 19 years old. That the mind is an energy field which transcends the physical brain. I had this insight, and I told a physicist at uh, NASA, the reaction was, uh, you should go live in California. <laughs> but one individual, a really great guy, uh, Isidore Adler, Dr. Isidore Adler, said, you should go research that, and he was serious. So I did. I spent many years researching the concept of uh, what I now call quantum field psychology, the idea being that the, the mind does transcend the physical brain, that energy from, projected from the brain or through, through the mind does follow the laws of physics and topological mathematics. Could it be we all have dormant powers lying within so far untapped? Nikolai Tesla said, what I'm trying to prove is how individuals can regain a higher state of consciousness on their own wings. Eastern approaches to the mind ask the same question. It is based in our self-image, which is pre-programmed. So mind's energy field is very restricted unless you learn how to step out of the mind so that you can connect into the infinite source of energy and information. So because mind reverse mind comes from the reactive perception of whatever we are facing at a given moment, at any given moment, as a result, its, its perceptions are limited to the way to by its conditioned past. And mind is operating according to its conditioning. It cannot step out of it. So in order to enter into creative mind, you have to step out of the conditioned ego mind that is operating through the left brain. So when you learn how to relax and enter into alpha brain wave states, all of a sudden it is the same mind, but it's not the same mind because you have now connected to intuitive, creative right brain. So it is the, it is the mind but it is more at peace, more connected, more in harmony with everything that is. These powerful ideas date back to the 1300s. Rosicrucian Fellowship was founded in 1909 by metaphysician Max Heindel, who published a book titled The Rosicrucian Cosmo Conception, from which many organizations were born. Jean de Galzin, introduces us to the Rosicrucian Fellowship and explains to us the perspective of this organization. This is a very unique organization, he stated, perhaps the most unique on the planet Earth. Its mission is to reveal and promote the esoteric, deeper meaning behind Christianity. All religions have two aspects, an exoteric aspect, which is more outward, and an esoteric aspect, which is more hidden. This does not mean that it is secret. It's just that you have to be in the right state of mind to access it. You can't fake it. You have to have the right mindset, the right attitude, the right spirit to be able to see beyond the external world. In quantum field psychology, you discuss the mind as an energy field that transcends the physical brain. This is true. The mind is actually part of a much broader spectrum. You see, we live in different worlds. We live in the physical world the world of touch, sight, sound, taste, and smell. But we also live in an emotional world where emotions are made of a substance different from matter. But we live in a world of thought as well, both concrete and abstract thought. This field of thought is permeating all of these different dimensions. And way beyond that, at still higher frequencies of energy, and even beyond energy, we live in a finer world where we connect with the finer aspects of our consciousness. So when you talk about the quantum field, this is invisible to the eyes, but in time, people will learn to recognize it. Even though we live in many worlds at once, most of these worlds are invisible to most people. But as you grow spiritually and come to understand the vast expanse of the worlds, you also realize the influence and the power of your emotions and thoughts on your life. They actually are your real life. So we exist in many worlds at once, simultaneously, varying by frequency, and what changes 
is our awareness of those frequencies. We can develop the flexibility to go into these worlds with our consciousness and be aware we're in them. And this is what the fellowship does. The fellowship trains you. First of all, it teaches you the reality of these other worlds. This includes how the universe was created in various dimensions of reality. And then it teaches you how to build different kinds of energy bodies. Think about this. If you want to go into space, you have to have a spacesuit. If you want to enter these different worlds, which exist at different frequencies, you have to develop a body that is made of the substance of the matter of that particular world. So the fellowship trains you in a very safe way to become aware of these different energy fields and then to attain them, to use them and make them dynamic. This is very unique. Buddha and many other avatars talk about the same principles we do, such as universal love. But there's a profound difference in our energy bodies between East and West. In the West, we are more materialistic because the physical body and vital body are very closely enmeshed with each other, which is not the case for people in other countries, in other parts of the world. Their vital and physical bodies still have a loose connection, which gives them a link with the inner planes. But that link is passive and is not under their control. They have a psychic connection, but it's not under their will. What the fellowship teaches is how to separate our physical and vital bodies consciously and under the power of our will. We are then able to connect with the inner planes in a conscious way. The training we have in the fellowship is totally different because of this. So if your physical and vital bodies remain tightly connected, you are materialistic. You see only through the five senses. But once you start developing spiritually, you learn to separate the higher ethers from the lower ethers which then gives you conscious access to the individual planes. So it's four levels of consciousness. If we talk about mind, we talk about consciousness. We have a body mind. That's the mind that's going to be in charge of your body, of your physical. Everything that is physical, that is in charge for you to sleep and exercise, all these things about body. Then you have an emotional mind. That's your animal mind. That's what you react. Every time you react, that's that mind in charge. Do you want to keep this mind always alive? You want to keep it in passion because that's your power. That's your, what's called also the ego mind. Then you have a third level. That is your human mind. That's your intellectual, your rational mind. And that is your consciousness. That is the one, the human mind that actually is in charge of all the other minds. That's the choice maker mind. And then you have this fourth level that is the spiritual mind. And that is the higher self. That's the part of you that guides you, that leads you just when you need to. That part of you that actually tells you what's right and what's not. And because you have such a mind, that's the reason you can trust yourself. You know, people go out and ask for opinions and live in confusion. When you actually can tap into this level of mind, you actually can really rely on the answers within you. Because actually, every single one of your answers is within you. The beautiful thing about this is it's never ending because we're talking about consciousness. And consciousness is an ocean that the more we tap into, the more we want because that's where the fulfillment is. That's where life is. And it's fine, it's great to go after material things and it's fine to go after prosperity and success. That's great, that all plays a part. But that is not ultimately what it's all about. If you actually don't live in that expansion of consciousness, what happens is that people are doomed to live in confusion, frustration, and to making costly mistakes that actually could be avoided if we just really move into the road of developing enlightening and heightening our consciousness. That's what the world is made of. 
and quantum science now is showing us how everything in the universe is made up of the same light of the same consciousness of the same material so you i the trees the universe down to every every subatomic particle is actually made of the same and it boils down in our terminology to mind to consciousness that is the key of what, how we're made the mind as energy or the mind as, as a emitter of energy, I'm not sure which is, is more accurate in that, or the mind as just an energy field, uh, makes a lot of sense to me because we don't really have a physical location for the mind. There's nowhere in the brain that any scientist has been able to say, there it is, we found it. Uh, some functions, obviously, they've identified with certain parts of the brain. In my world, God is all that there is. Now, am I remembering that in every moment? Not necessarily, but the truth is that I know, that I believe, is that God is all that there is. There is nothing but energy in this universe, energy in different forms, energy in different shapes, energy in, in presence that we don't see or necessarily feel or perceive, but it's there. The universe is an energetic field expanding and expressing upon and through itself. Impedance to the field can come in many forms. These can come as certain thought-emotion fixations which exist within us through prior learning. These are memories, feelings, experiences that we repress in the subconscious mind. The mind then projects energy it creates constantly, and that includes from subconscious levels. These repressed or deeper level formations filter into and influence the conscious levels. So if we have unresolved thought emotion fixations, that blocks what we're projecting and changes what we project. So we often manifest chaos without realizing it, even when we're trying to manifest something very positive. This is why the law of attraction does not work for many people, because they are blocking their own efforts with their hidden fixations, repressed memories, doubts, and fears. Axiom two of quantum field psychology is that thought is energy. Each of us has a unique energy signature and we are radiant beings. Tesla stated that everything that we once saw, heard, read, or learned accompanies us in the form of light particles. Brilliant photography, which uh, has recorded that, um, and we are, we're virtually light beings. I think that quantum physics is now proving that. We are programmed now to see what we see. We don't even see the truth because of our programming. Jean de Galzin stated, in quantum field psychology, you discuss the fact that since we are energy beings, we are radiant beings. This is true. Since God is light, if we walk into light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. That comes from St. John. We have beyond the physical body, a body of light or a vital body. This body has four separate dimensions and each dimension serves a particular purpose. The two higher ethers or dimensions which resonate at two higher dimensional levels are the energy dimensions whereby we accumulate spiritual energy from a daily expanse of life. And through spiritual activity, we extract from experience the essence of those experiences. This helps us build the soul body. The soul body is made of those two higher ethers, the light and the reflecting ethers, as well as the highest levels of our emotional and mental bodies. The two lower ethers are the chemical and life ethers. The chemical ether deals with assimilation and elimination, how we ingest food to build our bodies, how we build this food into our cells to create brains, nerves, tissues, bones, you name it. This is a fundamental process in the more materialistic side of the etheric or vital body. The second level of the etheric body is called the life ether. This level has to do with the creative force inside us, the sex force, and it helps power the mental forces. 
All of these are part of that same creative divine force within us, which is the sacred force. This force is used for sexual reproduction and for the reproduction of our cells in the body. But there is far more to this mystery. To better understand this, we must go back to Lemuria, an ancient civilization some 100,000 years ago prior to Atlantis. In this time, we were in a state of consciousness similar to the animals, but we also were androgynous, which means we possess both sexes, not like today, where we are separate sexes, male and female. But in order for us to advance from the animal stage to the human stage, we had to split this consciousness. We had to use one half of the creative force for reproduction. And the second half was used to build the brain and the larynx, which became our new organ of creation. Using the creative power of a spoken word, we will eventually speak the lost word, which has great power to manifest upon Earth. Our mission is to learn how to balance the energies in each of these etheric levels. Ultimately, we need to gain control over these energies to reduce what we eat and to reduce the use of the sex force for reasons other than reproduction, and eventually feeding more energy to the higher two ethers. The third ether, the light ether, has to do with sense perception and body temperature. It helps regulate emotions and how the emotions affect us. The fourth ether is the reflecting ether and is part of our mental processes. These include memory, the process of reflection, and use of logic and reason. These processes help us overcome and tame our desires and our emotions to keep things in balance. To summarize, we have two higher ethers, the light and reflecting ethers, and two lower ethers, the chemical and life ethers. Part of our mission in life is to increase the energy to the higher ethers and decrease it in the lower ethers. Eventually, these two separate fields separate, and when they separate, we get conscious access to different worlds. That's part of the training the Rosicrucian Fellowship offers. Thought energy, actually it's thought emotion energy that we generate, project forth, manifests as a transverse wave, just like electromagnetic energy. Where e-mag energy, electromagnetic energy, you have electrical field perpendicular to the magnetic field. Same with thought energy is perpendicular to emotional energy. So the emotional energy we give off with the thought energy determines how it's going to manifest. Think of this that thought energy creates a template or a form for something material to manifest into. And the emotional energy attracts to that form certain types of matter. So we can create very positive things or very negative things. Each thought emotion wave is expressed as wavelength equals spatial frequency times amplitude times phase. We're radiant beings and the question is what is it that we radiate? What we radiate is our energy field. The energy field is also what we know as our aura. What is the aura is the hidden life force within every single person. Now, when you measure this aura is when you can see how a person is. If you're lifeless, if you're stressed out, if you're tired, that'll all show right in your aura. Or on the other hand, if you're passionate, ex excited, enthusiastic, happy, peaceful, everything is right there. You can read it in your aura, you can measure it in the aura. What's really emanating of our aura at all times, and that's what we need to watch for, is our desires, our thoughts and emotions. That's constantly being radiated out through our aura. So that's what we need to take care of because we want to emit the best quality of thoughts, the best quality of emotions. Every single one of our desires, every single one of our emotions, any single one of our intentions is actually radiated out. It goes out into the universe and it gets back to us. So we really want to be able to be mindful, if we may, of those of those thoughts, of those feelings, of those emotions, of those desires that we harbor in our hearts. The key thing is the quality of our aura is determined by 
how much we know ourselves and the power that we radiate out. So in order to tune into the creative dimension of the spirit, we have to learn how to quiet the mind. So that is so rigidly held in our unconscious patterns and thinking mode, reactive mode, distorted perceptions, in order to eliminate that part, actually you have to learn how to withdraw from that mind so that you tune into the creative dimension of the spirit. And then once the mind is connected, disconnected from the ego mind and connected to the spirit, the higher dimension, it begins to function as a friend and as a as a as an extension of the higher higher mind rather. There, there's a, uh, I would take it maybe a step further, maybe your next question, but the, the, I, I feel like we're receiving energy and emitting energy constantly so that, that we're basically a, a uh, circulating focus point in the, in the universe so that as we receive energy from, from the universe, we're, we're emitting energy and you know the science is showing us that Various organs are emitting electro electromagnetic energy. Uh, my favorite thing is, you know, about 15 years ago, I read that that the electro electromagnetic electromagnetic energy from the brain would light the city of New York for six days. Lightning and brain electromagnetic activity share similar properties. Pretty phenomenal to to think about that we had that much uh, energy just just in our our the synapses of our brain. So. Yeah, it's all it's all energy, you know, cells and made of atoms and you know the molecules and atoms and particles, it all breaks down to energy. We are radiant beings and this radiance is the very nature of the energy. So in in my own experience, as I open to personally, as I open to life and its infinite presence, there is something that moves a blade of grass from being something that is perceived, I perceive as something somewhat dead into a, a presence which is vibrant and alive. Just this morning, I was sitting on my lanai looking out onto just the beauty that was around and everything went into, almost from grays to this vibrant technicolor of life. And this is, the radiance that exists everywhere present, and it is always there, but it's tapping into that radiance. It's allowing oneself to see it, to feel it, to experience it, and to be it. And if we attune ourselves, we attune ourselves to that radiance in one another as well. We, we can attune ourselves to seeing and perceiving and, and experiencing the radiance, the aliveness of each other. So there's 10 levels of radiance. The first level starts from stability. That's your dependability. So that's why you can, you know, sometimes you see very earthly people connecting. You say why that is, because they're connecting from that level. And the next level is the, your level of passion, your level of excitement, your level of, of happiness. So your bubbliness, that's what connects you to one another and so on. So when you move up to the higher levels, you're up to connecting and radiating the light of compassion, the light of ben benevolence. So you connect from that place. Then you move up into the, in, you continue moving up into the higher planes of consciousness and, and you move into another place of knowingness. You continue going on into the level of understanding where you have that empathy. You know, you can connect with others at that level. You know, uh, you feel when, you, when you're in the presence of people where you feel understood, you feel they get you. That's that level of understanding and it's vast. It's not only your physical level of understanding, it's someone that understand the whole picture. They, they get you, but they get the whole picture around you. Those are higher levels of connectivity. Then you move into even a higher level. That's the level of wisdom. That's a level that actually is shapeless. At that level, it's not even a thought. It's sparks, it's uh, flashes, and 
you connect from that level too. And at the higher level is the spiritual level where we're all one. And, and that's the level that we want to get to, where we're all one. Where we can actually see one another and see that spark and see that spark in beyond everything else that we see. Axiom three of quantum field psychology is the principle of connectivity. Now, because it radiates, it also connects. The, the energy we radiate connects to other people. So all minds connect as well. All minds also connect to divine mind. And it will actually commune with divine mind when a person understands that, because divine mind exists inside all of us, which is not generally known. We do have a local field. I've seen uh, photography for that, and I've had my aura um, photographed. That's my local field. And since I'm just energy, that's really all that I believe that I am, I'm, I'm energy, my energy connects out into the larger field. Wonderful, so what do we connect to? Actually, we connect, we connect at that level, even though we're not conscious of it. We're not conscious of how we connect. Have you ever wondered why you walk into a room of thousands of people and you connect to that one person? Why is that? That's because we are connecting at that energy, invisible level of mind, of energy. That's our auras connecting and detecting who is vibrating at the same frequency. And we actually radiate our aura has 10 levels of light emanating from your physical body and out like the ripples effects of the ocean. And so we actually connect from each one of those levels. And it starts from the base. Every frequency, when as it starts from the, in the physical plane, it's denser than the next. As you move up, it gets more subtle it gets more ephemeral, it gets more spiritual. As you move down, it becomes denser and the frequency is slower. So, of course, we all want to radiate from those higher planes. The force between two people is given by F equals M1 plus M2 times G divided by D squared, where M is the ego mass of each person, G is a constant for ego force, and D is the psychological distance between the two persons. Another issue connected to this is the idea of connectivity. That as we project energy, we connect to everything around us, including plants, water, animals. And they often pick up our wavelengths. Right, right. This is Emoto's work with water, where he showed that water crystals right. were taking on certain patterns given our thought patterns. Right. Can you tell us more about that, please? Right. And that, that Japanese scientist who really showed how your thoughts and your feelings are reflected in water molecules. And that is very important that your, your body is mostly water. And everything that you think in your mind reflects in the body because your water molecules, they, they immediately start assuming your thought forms and are affected by that. And therefore, most people do not understand how badly they can damage their health and their well-being by just thinking the wrong kind of thoughts of feeling guilty or holding grudge or anger or fear in their heart. So in other words, whether you are loving to somebody or to yourself, if the love automatically affects your health and well-being, because whenever you are loving to somebody else, you are producing the effect of love on your own, uh, on your own blood cells, and they begin to, they begin to take the form, assume the form of your thought forms, and if your thought forms are negative, your your blood will begin to shift into that, just like when you pray over the food you can change the composition of the food as well as water. And so also, that also shows that as soon as what you think, you are more connected to your body through your nervous system than even external objects. So you can understand 
how powerful your thoughts are and how does it affect your health, your peace of mind, and your relationship with yourself as well as with the world. Because we don't practice or somehow participate in the connectivity, we have this ability, this thing that goes on in society where we hurt each other feeling like there's no no negative uh, impact at all. So we're, you know, for me it's connected. Our connectivity and our connection with everything and everyone goes back to the energy field. If we're an energy field, then we're not a discrete, uh, back to sort of Newton, the, the concept of the billiard ball. You know, Newton said, one of Newton's laws was, or was that every act, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. The, the application of that, though, got down to where, well, we're just a billiard ball banging against a billiard ball and not an energy field banging or bumping against and moving through other energy fields. So if we're just billiard balls, then nothing, there's no impact except for things moving off from each other. But if we're energy fields that are intertwined and moving through each other, we're, we're causing a change all the time. I just read somewhere where uh, the, uh, our hands raising up moves the planets even just a little bit. As there is only one life, and that life is the life of God, we are all connected in this infinite presence. That connectivity is a connectivity of heart and mind, that there is only one mind. There is one thinking substance. That thinking substance is living and moving and having its beingness as each and every one of us. So we are part of this infinite whole. We are as a cell to a human body. We are individuals in this infinite field of of connectivity, all of it connected, nothing separate, nothing apart, that there is no separation. Hard to believe because, you know, the chair is over there and I'm sitting on something that feels like a chair, could it be connected? But the truth is, there's a oneness that binds and connects all things. So by energy, we're all connected. We are by all energy. connected through Different that frequency. energetic field mm -hmm. that I call God. Uh -huh. yeah. right. So, which vibrates at different frequencies for every object. Yes. Or every kind of thought. Yes, yes, that there are different vibrations. And so, so if I am in a field of sadness or depression, I am at one level of vibration. If I move myself up to the vibration of love, of bliss, I am at a vibration which is in alignment with this energetic field and I raise my capacity to connect into this field of creativity and this, this infinite presence willing to release itself and download itself everywhere. Each constellation of energies is composed of many dimensions of thought, emotion, fixation. In each dimension, a pattern of wavelengths given by W of I to K equals KP of I up to KP of K. Tesla said that matter is an expression of infinite forms of light. Axiom four of quantum field psychology is the principle of communication. Along with being energy beings, we are feeling beings. Jean de Galzin further explained, when we communicate, we do radiate a wide array of energies. Each human being is like an antenna. We radiate our thoughts, our emotions, and we radiate our physical energy. For example, if you go to the gym, you see people pumping iron and they radiate this energy. They are full of fire. By contrast, if you go to the hospital, you see people sick in bed, and they are deficient in energy. Many are vampirizing your energy, draining it from your energy field. You can see the vital body is not in the same mode for these two groups of people. One is very passive and almost dying. The other is vital and vibrant, pumping iron and energy to the max. Most importantly, we are responsible for our own health. If we make the effort and do the right thing, we will increase our health. But if we neglect our health and wait on someone else to do it for us, then our energy decreases and we become sick. So we are responsible for ourselves, for this radiance. And when we radiate our energy, we're communicating it constantly to others. 
and their energy is picked up by people in many ways. Now let's say you're new to the neighborhood, you just moved in. Suppose Paul from next door comes to you and says, hi, I'm Paul, nice to meet you. Saturday, we're having a block party. Please come and bring your family. So you go to the party on Saturday. You don't know anybody but Paul. Then as you begin to meet people, you might like this one, but you don't like that one. We each have a filter around us, an aura of many layers of energy. In this aura, you have your thoughts, your emotions, your etheric power, your habits, all anchored by your physical body. The aura is filled with magnetic fields of attraction and repulsion toward other people, things, events, and so on. As you move around in a crowd, your aura bumps into other people's auric fields, and it either clashes with them, harmonizes with them, or is neutral. So the first impressions you get from a person comes from how your aura interacts with the aura of that person. The next point is very important. After the first impressions hit you, your mind then begins to rationalize and build many thoughts around those impressions. This is why their first impressions can last forever. A strong emotional reaction to that person will be held in place by many rationalizing thoughts. The aura gives you the first impulse, forming emotional reactions, then rationalizing thoughts follow. An entire belief system evolves from those initial impressions. In the aura, all of our thoughts, our emotions, and our habits are there for everybody to pick up. Most people are not attuned to these levels and do not see them, not until they walk a higher path. What we radiate is also influenced by various forms of toxins. We must eliminate physical toxins through how we eat, doing cleanses, exercise, and so forth. But we must also eliminate etheric toxins emotional toxins, and mental toxins. We must eliminate bad habits, negative thinking, and negative emotions. Resentments, hatred, sabotaging others, all that. We must also eliminate spiritual toxins, having the wrong spiritual view of things. When you have the wrong concept, the wrong idea. So you have to cleanse your whole system, physical, etheric, emotional, mental, and spiritual. Once you have done this, you're able to radiate and broadcast the best of life. Tesla emphasized that we all need a supreme guidance for all vital and spiritual energies and labor, including purification of the many effects and needs of man. Harmony. That means if two people are vibrating at a similar frequency, they enter into communion. That means the messages could be non-verbally communicated. But that is very difficult. And that's what I teach, how to enter into energy field that is non-mental, so that it's intuitive, direct communication begins to happen. And most people, that, that energy communication could be also be seen through the breath work. If one person is agitated and frustrated and wants to move faster, other person is slow, communication is broken. So that means there is energy field is very different. One wants to move faster, other is moving slower. And it is reflected in the breath. So if you can synchronize your breath with another person, and if you have synchronization of common interest in the subject that is being discussed, there is energetic harmony that begins to emerge. So, but if they, are, if they are arguing with each other, that, that means they have lost energetic harmony and synchronicity. So if, some, if there is a conflict in, in discussions, just if both people will just breathe, breathe normally, slow down, meditate, relax, and then talk, I think there is a better chance of communication and, and a mental level or because it has to be brought out of the emotional level. When I'm right, you are wrong. I want to prove myself. So at communication level, that energy field, connection, and learning how to connect to your own energy field. So even if other person's frequency is not right, you can adjust yours to there by recognizing where they are, 
understanding where they are and not expecting them to be different than the way they are. And then all of a sudden, you can bring them into your energy field and communication can be established. Outstanding, so you create attunement with them. Attunement, yes. I mean, the same vibrational field right. they're at. So more communication. But you have to have the person who wants to restore that harmony, they must have that mastery over their own mind, over their own emotions, so they can regulate theirs first in order to bring others into the synergy. Yes. And when you communicate from a higher frequency than most folks you deal with, it's, it can be more challenging. Yes. Because you've got to find where their frequency is and bring yourself into their level so they will understand what you're saying. Right. And if you, in other words, if I want to bring you into my harmony, I have to let go of my emotional reactions to you, which is, once I do that, I have worked with my own reaction. Now, once I become non-defensive, I also become non-offensive to you. When I become that way, then I'm more objective about what, whatever I was facing before. As a result, I can help you to come back into synchronicity with energetic field that, have, that should be established for communication. And this is what is so important in any kind of intimate love relationship, business relationship, or friendship relationship. Also in healing. We are all energy beings. We all connect and are at the thought level, we can connect to all different of plants, animals. We can connect at the angelic being with an angelic sources. And we connect at all different levels. And we can also tune in to each other's thoughts. The more that we evolve and the more that our bodies become subtle, we can pick more because this body is your source of connectivity. This body is where you connect from. Even your thoughts are emanating from your brain. So as you keep your body pure, as the purity of your body, the purity of your thoughts, the purity of your emotions actually open you up to receive vibrations from other subtle entities, be it being it um, at the angelic realm or at the animal kingdom. We have that power. Us human beings, we have the power to connect at all different levels and to pick up thoughts from other people. We can pick up um, actually you can read a person's aura and you connect through that means as well. Communication is happening all the time in, through, and as all things, as there is one infinite alive universe. So we might think of a rock as something that's dead. You know, we, we don't usually think of things that are inanimate objects as being a life and being in this field of energy. But the truth is that there is an aliveness, this energetic field is alive and awake in all things. So chairs, for example, are, are imperceptibly moving. We know this now. They're, they're, so there is a life, there, there is a movement in, through, and as all things. And as that's happening, as life is revealing itself, that connection, that communication is, is happening so that, that there's nothing that is happening that is isolated or separate from this in, infinite field of creativity and uh, this field of creation. That there can be no life that's outside of this entire field of, of beingness. So we may think that we are not communicating with one another. We may think that we are transparent. We are, excuse me, we are the opposite of transparent, that we are uh, opaque to the realization, to the experience of others, to animals, to the energetic field around us. But the truth is that field is picking up the energy that we are. We are sending out the vibration of who and what we are, we are our beliefs all the time. So um, 
um, that, that, that field of communication is something for us to attend to, for us to be aware of, and our own awareness to where we are, what our thoughts are, what our emotional state is, what our, what our presence is. Axiom 5 of quantum field psychology considers creativity as energy beings. To what extent do our powers of creativity reach? Just what are we capable of creating? We think about what we become. So we really do have to be very vigilant of our thoughts. We're raising our vibration, and in raising our vibration, we're attracting. That which we want is already there. It, it becomes attracted to us, but it's we must rise above and see the thing that we want, envision it, and actually live as though it's happening now. Jean de continued, a common fallacy that many have is that God is up there and we are down here. Thereby, they completely separate the creator from the creation. You, of course, cannot do this. Creation and creator are one. Think of it this way. If you look at a person's arm, there's light going through every particle, every molecule of that arm. Our entire body is a magnificent machine. The way it works, the way it repairs itself, the way we digest food, everything about it. I'm in awe every time I think about it. But the creator is all part of it. Let's go deeper. We see space as spirit, and we see matter as crystallized space, which means that matter is crystallized spirit. So how do you decipher where they separate? They don't separate. Let's go back before time. In the beginning, the cosmic word was pronounced. John said in the beginning was the word, and the word is God, and the word was God, and there was nothing made without him. Well, what he meant is that this word is like a cosmic vibration. Think of it like this. You have a tuning fork and you hit it, ting. And as this tuning fork vibrates, it creates forms. Hans Jenny, back in the 1960s, proved this. He took sand on a piece of glass and he vibrated a particular keynote, which is a specific frequency. And suddenly, a geometric pattern appeared. Then he did it again, again, and again. And every time he hit the same frequency, the same geometric pattern would come back, the same form. Then he used all kinds of different things like gels, paste, and powders. He made all kinds of wonderful patterns. He found many geometric forms created by the power of sound. So, let's go back to the cosmic word, the original sound. It started eons ago and resonates throughout the entire universe continuously. Creation was not just one moment, but it's happening all the time. The sound just keeps going and creating all these forms. Look at photos taken by Hubble's telescope. It's fascinating. All these new galaxies are being born at every moment. Creation is constantly happening. This energy, this light, or this spirit is behind it. It's a vast array of vibrations, like a keynote or an infinity of keynotes. Suppose you press on a piano and you play ACG, your chord. Then you have a sound, and the sound vibrates the universe. That's what God or the Creator does to vibrate the spiritual universe. So, the complex of sounds vibrates, and all these forms came up. Same thing. You can't just separate it because if you stop the sound, the whole form disappears. The whole thing vanishes. So sound is ongoing to maintain the form. And each of us is doing the same thing. We sound everything. We sound off. We're setting our thoughts, our emotions, our habits, and thereby creating our own lives. We usually don't realize it, but we are responsible for everything we think, feel, say, and do. And we are going to have to answer for what we've done through the laws of karma. It is a law of cause and effect. You create a cause, it has an effect, or an entire universe of effects. For example, if you don't eat right, you become sick. So you go to the doctor and the doctor gives you a pill or perhaps some surgery. This is not addressing the cause, only the effect. We have to go back to the real cause of the problem, which is your cause, you caused it. So you remove the cause and eventually the effect will go away. 
and you'll return to vibrant health. Plus, the pills or surgery have side effects, and you'll need more pills or treatments to address those side effects. And those create more side effects, and the process keeps going. So the buck stops with us. You are, we are, I am responsible. Creativity is really about getting out of the box and be willing to do something differently. You see, we all have that seed of creativity within us, but so many people are afraid to try something new and, and explore something new, something different, something different. Make a salad in a different way, take a different road to, to come home. Creativity is your power. It's actually what fulfills us. When we connect with our higher self, through the medium of meditation, we become the co-creator with the, with the creator, basically. Because the creator is, we can say, the cosmic I am, or God the Father, and individual I am, this, we can call it the Son of God. So Son of God is not co-creator with God the Father. If the Son of God is, uh, that is I am within me, is identified with my self-image and identified with my mind-made sense of separate self-image. Then I'm not co-creator, I'm creator against the creator. So it really means to be in attunement with our divine source within. Within, in order to be in co-creation with God yes. and be in harmony. Yes. Yes. Then in that harmony, what kinds of things can a human being create in the physical world? What are some examples of that? The world is holographic. In whatever way you interact with the present, you are interacting with the whole, because present and the omnipresent presence are not separate. If I hate you or I fear you, I am, not se I am separate from you and me, which means I am separate from the whole that I am within me. So this is this also one of the secrets that yogic scriptures that dis describe any change in thought patterns will manifest and send prana into creating something different from that source. Right, right. Which it separates us from the source, builds the ego, builds the separation. Well, that's good or bad, as you mentioned in your seminar. Right, right. Good or bad. So if it is, the whole idea is to how to enter into co-creation. And what is co-creation? And so we have to understand that I am within us is the soul. And energy is through which the soul manifests and becomes life force. And so we, interact, we become in a subject-object manifestation in the polarity dimension. But at the level of I am, there is no subject-object separation, because in whole, there is no separation between subject and object. But when the whole that is I am within us, when it manifests, it, se it separates and operates as polarity, where subject and object are in harmonious interplay. So just as unity manifests through polarity, there is, that means the polarity of subject and object has an underlying unity, means harmony. So this teaching is how to go to the level of polarity and establish harmonious interaction with everything that comes within the field of my awareness in the form of object. How do I, uh, that is the meaning of co entering into co-creation. Co-creation and in harmony with the whole. We create, where's that come from? The creative powers. So, Going backwards, maybe a little to our science of mind concept, you know, I like the idea that if we're receiving energy, we're receiving energy from the universe, whether we call that divine energy or God or spirit or whatever. And I look at that as the generator of what I would call the creative idea, the creative concept. And as we are one with that flow of energy, then we're creating along with it. That, that uh, some people use the term co-creation, but to me that, that what, would, what, would it be, I co what would I be co-creating with if I'm one? 
So, so if I'm one with the universe, one with spirit, one with God, then there's a creative process and God is creating out of itself into itself and through its own creation. So um, one of the things I loved about Ernest Holmes' writing when I first read it uh, almost 20 years ago was he talked about involution, God creating out of itself, but basically creating through its own creation and then what happens when it shows up in form is evolution. So we move from involution to evolution and you know my current way of thinking is we're evolving every second. Creation is always happening and creation begins with this infinite field of energy, with this life that again I call God, spirit, infinite presence, universal presence. That presence is always creating from, I'm going to say nothing. And when I say nothing, it's not that there is nothing because there is always energy, it is energy. But that creation is happening from a field of apparent nothingness. So creation, it is, it, spirit, infinite presence is contemplating all of the time. And in that contemplation comes forth its own idea of itself. It brings forth from its ideas that which is, is, has come from the field of contemplation. Now we as human beings, we are one with this infinite presence and we have been given the capacity to be in this field of creativity. So our thoughts are the activity of, in contemplation of creation, that as we think, energy is created from wherever it is at the time and moved into a field of manifestation. That's in a simple way how creation happens. And two, I don't want to leave this moment without saying that it is belief that is underlying that's in that field of that uh, formula. One of the key ingredients is belief because if I am in my field of contemplation and moving forward to towards um, uh, fulfilling my vision, then it will not happen that that vision will come into manifestation if I'm in the back of my mind thinking, oh, that's not really going to happen. So there is an alignment. There is an alignment with the oneness of the universe, a, a divine yes, a sacred yes, that's happening with creation. That's how we're able to step into this, this infinite field of creation and tap into it and make manifest infinite possibilities. Nikolai Tesla said about visualization, events of my life and my inventions are real in front of my eyes. And I made corrections on most of my inventions by visualization. Axiom six of quantum field psychology considers the issue of manifestation. If our powers of creativity extend far beyond our former imaginations, just how far do our powers of manifestation reach? What are we truly capable of creating upon this earth and upon our lives? Let's begin with the idea that we're all free and the truth will make you free, which is what Christ taught. This is absolutely true. If you look at what Christ taught in the New Testament, as reported by the first four apostles and by Paul, he is actually teaching a course in mind and soul development. We must understand that the kingdom of heaven is not a physical place, but is literally a state of mind and consciousness. For example, in the story of the Garden of Eden, the point is that when you enter a divine state of mind, you can manifest anything you wish. Part of this state of mind includes maintaining emotions of pure divine joy. So that what you dwell upon and what you feel can manifest just like that. Nikolai Tesla stated that Keeping a state of ecstasy at all times allowed him to access the higher mind within to discover his great inventions. But once you leave the Garden of Eden, that is, fall out of communing with God and the divine power inside you, then you enter a more hellish state where you create chaos and confusion. So we leave the Garden of Eden through confusion or by being distracted by the lower desires. We then cause chaos and self-destruction until we come back into alignment with the divine mind inside us, which is the purpose of reincarnations upon earth. This parallels the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son leaves a father, 
or divine contact and enters into riotous living, drinking, running around with women. When he wakes up and realizes his error, he returns to contact with divine mind, the Father, and then receives all the goodness and wealth of God's mercy and grace. This flows to him and through him. There are many other parallels in spiritual teachings that support the concept that life on earth is really all about attaining a divine state of consciousness. So our question is, what is the greatest question mankind has? That question is, who are we? What are we? What are we doing here? What's our purpose in life? We can't answer that until we understand we're divine beings. When we say namaste, an ancient concept from the East, it means I salute the divinity inside you. This is literally a true statement because it's based on the reality of the divine spark that is inside all of us. Our purpose is to bring it forth in our lives, to dwell in the Garden of Eden, to end the journey of the prodigal son and return to the divine father within. The only person I've heard, ever heard of is Sai Baba who, uh, who manifests. I've had I've had thoughts and they've shown up as gifts or they've, and very quickly, I mean, within a day or so, compassion and love. I, I think that's what really makes the world go round. To be of, it should be not what's in it for me, but how can I serve the world? How can I serve you? How can I serve the world? Uh, if we're going to get anywhere, uh, that's where we, we have to come together and understand that we're all in this together. Jean de Galzin further explained that another important concept is living consciously. He stated, most of us dream our lives away, not realizing what we're doing. We wake up in the morning, we get our breakfast, we get our coffee, we brush our teeth and take our shower, we go to work, we come back for lunch, we go back to work in the afternoon, we come back home, we're tired, we watch TV, we have dinner. For many of us, we live inside these routines and lose sight of the fact that we each have a mission here. We have a reason to be. We're not just here in a roller coaster or like a little rat in a cage. No, there is a reason we're here and we have to figure it out. Because as time goes on, we are wasting time and we could be building this soul inside of us that will eventually liberate us from this prison earth. During the Atlantean period, we were supposed to become more individualized as conscious beings. We were evolving from an animal consciousness and becoming individualized. So we were separated into male and female. We had to first learn the law of cause and effect, expressed as an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This was a way for us to understand boundaries in relationships. This is a transitory state of consciousness and equated to selfishness, a necessary step in the evolution of conscious states. And as we individualized and learned to think and act like separate beings, we built the mind, which was the objective. But because of the often extreme states of selfishness expressed, we were under the regimen called law and punishment. In other words, the law stated you had to follow a certain way. And if you broke the law, you were punished. That was under Jehovah and his angels. But what happened, man grew and he mentally and spiritually advanced. He began to use his mind and his cunning to break the law while learning to avoid punishment, which means this condition of being became obsolete and didn't work. Instead of continuing to evolve, we degenerated. So at that time, it became necessary for a new message to come. And that's when Christ came. You see, Jehovah is an angel, the next level up from humans, but Christ is an archangel, another level above the angels. So Christ came with a brand new concept that embodies our higher nature, a set of principles above law and order, principles which fulfilled the need for a greater set of laws at that time, which are the principles of love, harmony, joy, forgiveness, pure divine love, not selfish love, love, Forgiveness, empathy for others. Everything that Christ came to bring us is actually alchemy, spiritual alchemy in essence. Because if you think about it with your head, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, you love your enemy, come on. If he is my enemy, I've got to hate him, right? I mean, it doesn't make any sense intellectually. It doesn't work. But if you love your enemy, you'll turn them into friends. The ego does not understand this. 
It is rooted more in the older form of self and selfishness. People are actually projecting their feelings onto you, where much of perception is actually projection. To resolve these negative thoughts and feelings that generate projection, we can use spiritual alchemy. Using spiritual alchemy, we learn to become transformers of energy in many powerful ways. Tesla opined, the source of most disease is in the spirit. Therefore, the spirit can cure most diseases. How do we make manifestation happen? It starts with a dream. It starts, it's, it's like a seduction. It's the, like the act of seduction. As the dream knocks the door at your consciousness, it comes in and it offers itself to you for you to take it or not. So there you have it. You have a dream in front of you. But you, the conscious being, you have the choice to take it or to reject it. And that's the first step of manifestation. Tesla explained, if I do something where I do not understand, I force myself to think about it in my dreams and there find a solution. Then once you take that dream, you host it in your consciousness and that's a thought and that thought will bring other thoughts like a web one thought attracts another and it starts becoming a a whole network of thoughts one attracting the other so you want to make sure those thoughts are thoughts of love are thoughts of giving are thoughts of contribution are thoughts of power, because that's what you're going to attract. That's what's going to start forming at a conscious level. And if you go with the more base thoughts, that's what you're going to attract as well. And that manifestation is not going to last. So if you want a lasting manifestation, that step, the thought, the thought step needs to to stay at a selfless level, at a level where, where contribution comes in, at a level of love, because actually love is the highest, is one of the highest frequencies that we can tap into. And so infuse all of your, look to infuse every thought with love. Thought is also if you look at thought right here in your mind, it's very close to your eyes. So thought is also the level of vision. That's also where the picture comes in, where you actually, that thought becomes a picture. And from that picture, you can start injecting emotion. You start looking at the picture of what you want to create. And the look of it is going to inspire you to, to feel more and more emotion. So the emotion is what's going to move it, move it and speed it up to actually bring it into final manifestation and physical reality. So love it into being. Dwell upon it and love it into being. So Virtually. dwell upon, so dwell upon it and love it into being. Tesla revealed that the mental and emotional energies transform into what we want. The idea that our minds can precipitate and manifest matter is a total shift in thinking. Think about the experimental method. We do experiments where we try to keep all the variants out of the equation. Experimental bias means the experimenter unintentionally influences the outcome. An experimenter wants to prove a certain point of view to get it published, right? and so their thoughts and emotions influence the outcome without realizing it. One assumption in statistics, for example, is that all the different samples have the same variance. If they don't have the same variance within, none of the formulas work. Therefore, much of the research in social science is totally invalid. So once you practice yoga, the real teachings of yoga, you understand the hidden meaning behind some of the other spiritual teachings by the other masters. 
like Adam and Eve story. It is really such, it is really the story of Adam is the cosmic man and Eve is the cosmic female, cosmic father and cosmic mother. And in the entire creation, the cosmic mother is in our body, in human body, is called subconscious energy field. And cosmic father within each one of us, the soul that is I am, is called cosmic father's extension called the prodigal, the son, the son of God. Okay, the son of God and energy field in entire creation is in perfect harmony. Means in the mineral life, plant life, animal life, which represents the tree of creation. And what is the source from which this entire tree of creation has happened? We call that cosmic I am, God the Father. And, and it evolves through the mineral life, plant life, animal life, and then human. So human represents the fruit in the entire tree. And fruit holds the same seed from which the entire tree came. So what is the same what is the seed of creation? God the Father, the Creator. And so when it comes back as a seed, it is also called I am. So one seed that created the entire tree produces multitudes of seeds. We call the souls of the Atman. But that Atman now it has evolved to its ultimate. So it is called evolutionary journey from mineral life, plant life, to animal life, to human life, where I am that wasn't yet present all the way to animal kingdom reappears in human beings. And therefore that is that I am is independent creator. And that independent creator can again can separate from the source, the Father. And if that independent creator separates from the oneness, because he has the freedom to choose for or against what is present, if he does separate, then it is called prodigal son. Okay? And then once the prodigal son goes too far and wastes father's wealth, what is father's wealth? In the human body, it is our prana, our life force. So when you use it uh, to create internal friction, internal conflict, which represents conflict with the external world, emotions, fear, control issues, self-rejection, guilt, blame, shame, all those experiences are using the subconscious energy of God, the Creator, through which whole creation come to being. But I have an independent Creator, I'm abusing this same life force to move away from the source that I am. So when I use the same energy that is connecting me to the source that I am, now I'm using it to create separative self-image. That is called the prodigal son moves more further and further away from the father. So what is Adam and Eve there? So Adam and Eve Adam is the cosmic father or cosmic soul that is within us and Eve is the subconscious energy body. So superconscious consciousness and subconscious energy field represents the Adam and Eve within each one of us. So when you, when you are any time any human being is facing any particular issue, any particular object, they are reacting to it. What is reaction? Reaction means I am personally choosing to look at this object as good or bad. So God is saying to Adam and Eve, do not choose good, the fruit of the good and evil. What is the fruit of good and evil? Good and evil in, in prodigal son is built into his separate body of self-image. And that is what names it good and evil. So if you do not, so Adam and Eve, if they choose the fruit of good and evil, then 
they are going, moving into the external world of object, trying to turn good and hold it, control it, and evil, remove it or run from it or avoid it or ignore it. See, this is where human beings become the prodigal son. So what is, what is, and then once you do that, you are thrown out of the Garden of Eden. God, Adam and Eve are thrown out of Garden of Eden. So what is the way back according to yoga? Meditation. What is meditation? Choiceless awareness or witness. I do not choose. When you do not choose, you are following what God said to Adam and Eve. Do not choose. So the moment you do, do not choose, you dismantle your, from your pre-programmed conditioned past that has been all created by choice for or against. So when you remain choiceless, you get back into the Garden of Eden. And that is not like something that happened somewhere in the history where man was born from apes or something like that. No, man is born every moment. Man is equal to mind. And man minus mind equal God. So that is why all the meditations are about how to rise above the body, mind, ego, emotions, and fears. So where does it come from? From choice. When you let go of your choice, you enter into the Garden of Eden. How did Christ say? What does he teach? He says, Thy will be done, my Lord, not mine. Means I do not choose. Same thing. When, I, when I'm witness, I do not choose. One proposition of quantum field psychology is that thought energy evolves into material forms. Then the real meaning of evolution is not about the evolution of material forms over the ages, but rather the evolution of consciousness through the expression of different physical vehicles. All of us create our lives constantly as we go along, but are often unaware of doing so. Many people think negative and expect negative. It has been estimated that the average person thinks about 95% negative thoughts all day long. So they manifest negative events and relationships in their lives, which are self-defeating. This causes them and other people infinite chaos while not realizing they are doing so. Always blaming someone else, attacking, it's someone else's fault and so forth. Many of the psychological disorders we treat, the person creates themselves. When we combine the concepts of quantum physics, topological mathematics, major modern day psychologies, and Eastern and Western philosophies, they fit together under a new paradigm called quantum field psychology. Axiom 7 of quantum field psychology considers the issue of attunement with higher powers. How do we actually attune our thoughts and emotions and behavior to the frequencies, to the levels of higher powers of consciousness? With those thoughts of how can I serve, then all the powers that be come to help you and the, the path falls out literally and follow the yellow brick road right down to um, uh, the Wizard of Oz is one of it. I mean, that is a great uh, story. The wizard is within. All she had to do was click her heels and think, say, I want to go, and she was home. Jean de Galzin explained that we often communicate with higher spiritual powers and we all have a divine presence inside us. He said, we call it the higher self or the God within. Let's look at the human body. And this magnificent machine is being created by our own thoughts and feelings daily in part. What's the purpose of having a machine like this? Let's use the analogy the body is like a car. Well, there's a driver inside. Who is the driver? The spirit, which is a flame within us, which is eternal. That's part of our being. It has no beginning, no end, and lives forever. It sounds completely outside the pale of our thinking because we think everything is measured with limits and so forth. For many of us, the infinite force is something we are having great difficulty understanding. We have to use our abstract mind to try to get out of the box. This eternal spirit desires to run on its own dynamic cosmic faculties. But many of these are dormant until awakened. So the spirit makes this sojourn through matter to apply these faculties in the physical world and apply them through this body. The spirit 
The driver inside of this vehicle drives on the freeway of life. And so anyone drives on the freeway of life, he misses different circumstances. He has problems and challenges that he has to solve. He meets people he has to deal with. Some are good, some are challenging. And pretty soon through all this, he gathers experience. The experience becomes learned and then second nature. And these create a growing wisdom. Every experience we have can contribute to this wisdom. And out of this, we extract an essence, a quintessence. And that quintessence is what creates our soul. To better see this, spirit, soul, mind, and body are all different levels of who and what we are. We are made up of four bodies, a physical body, a vital or etheric body, an emotional body, and a mental body. These are the four elements of alchemy, the four elements of psychology, the four elements of astrology. And out of these four elements, we extract a fifth element. We call it quint in Latin. This means fifth, which gives us quintessence. And that quintessence is the extract from all of these four elements that becomes our soul. It's the extract of those spiritual powers that the spirit has put into motion from dormant to dynamic. So now when we say we're developing our spiritual faculties, this is what we're doing. We're actually activating our divine faculties. The I am inside of us, the highest self inside of us, the spirit within us is driving this whole journey. And the purpose is for us to become like him, to become able to apply every power of the universe. When we get to that level, we can do incredible things. Ultimately, we have to get out of this material world. We can attain eternal life, the new consciousness that Christ spoke about. And to attain this eternal life, we have to learn all the rules of the physical world, all the ramifications, all the reasons, everything about this world and be done with it, assimilate it into our soul, and then move on to the next plane of consciousness. Axiom eight of quantum field psychology asks the question of transfiguration. As we attune our thoughts and emotions to higher frequencies, is it possible that we can actually transform who we are from more of a human state to more of a divine state of mind and being? Attuning your mind to higher level frequencies, what it does, it liberates you. It um, opens up your sixth sense, your seventh sense. It's open you. It lifts you up from the physical world. It opens, opens the door from the physical reality into the unlimited reality, into the ocean of possibilities of, of potential that exist that exist in the world and it's all for our taking all we need to do is just raise our frequency and live and stay in that frequency as much as we can and the way to do that is to attune your thoughts to ideas where contribution where selflessness is where it's uh it's all of us together ideas where where we are all one and we can connect to that truth. That's liberating because you're no longer alone in the world. All of a sudden you connect to everything. You're a part of everything and everything is a part of you. How did Christ, Moses, Buddha, Krishna manifest their higher states of consciousness? They did so by connecting with the divine mind. They communicated with it. They allowed the power to flow through them. So the conscious mind and superconscious mind became one. And what came through them was enormous, unlimited power, light, and creativity. This allowed Christ to take a few fishes and loaves of bread and make food for thousands upon thousands of people. He made it manifest just like that. By concentrating upon the concept, the energy flowed through him and it manifested as physical matter. We see that the, the supreme state of consciousness that is inborn within us as a potential is obstructed by our ego mind, which acts as a major of uh, distortions. So then in order to reach to that radiant being that we are, we have to learn how to meditate. What is meditation? Meditation means anything that comes within the field of my reactive perception I want to withdraw from that 
so that when I re remove from the reactive perception, I withdraw from my past. And when I withdraw from my past, I can see what is present, rather than see it the, the, as, as revealed by my reactive perception. Means resurface perception that were unresolved in my past. When I see through it, I don't see what is, I see what was. It, but it is, that means you are, not, you are not seeing the problem where it is. You are seeing the phantom image of the problem that is revealed by the, the reaction, means reactivated action that sur resurfaces. Akashic records means uh, you, have, you have an access to unlimited potential for energy and information. So whenever you enter, let's say, into deeper state through the practice of meditation or yoga nidra or the meditation-based yoga nidra that I teach, people can access the, that, that zero stress zone where the performer disappears into higher state of consciousness. Performer, that ego is dissolved into the higher state of consciousness. And that, scientifically, we say, you have dropped into alpha, theta brain waves. So when you enter into that dimension, you are connecting to inner stillness. And like Christ said, be still and know that I am God. That means in that stillness, you are accessing the divine potentials that has been dormant. So entire practice of yoga as, uh, to the, is about meditation, because that's the door that opens the infinite potential that is not accessible intellectually. You cannot comprehend it through the medium of mind, and that is why you have to enter it through the medium of meditation. To consider the process of transfiguration, Jean de Galzin explained, we must first discuss thoughts that generate a field of force that shapes the environment. We also talk about feelings and emotions, which are part of what we call the desire body, and desires are magnetic. You have attraction on the one hand and repulsion on the other. And in between, we have a state of neutrality or indifference. So your thoughts actually send motion into those feelings, creating e-motion. This sets the magnetic field around you. So when you want something, you go after it. You're attracted to it. This is where the law of attraction comes into it. But that's only a small part of the equation. At a higher conscious level, we are seeking to attract things of the spirit. Once we start attracting things of matter, we're going back into materialism. We're going away from the spirit. The whole point is that we are spiritual beings, and we are eternal beings already. So this is what we have to concentrate upon. We don't want to continue to be a slave to the physical world, always buying more stuff that will possess us instead of us possessing them. We want and need to be free, and to be free, we have to let the materialism go. Christ said, give up your goods and follow me. He didn't mean you have to get rid of your car and your house and everything else. He meant get rid of this attraction you have for possessing things since they actually possess you. So you must become detached from them. Then you are free. Then you can use them as an instrument for good for the time being to fulfill your mission upon earth, whatever mission that might be. It doesn't mean you have to throw away all things. It just means you have to detach yourself from them. That is one component of transfiguration. Another component is that of projection. Much of perception is in fact projection. People are actually projecting their thoughts and feelings onto us all the time. So for example, someone might say, I don't like what you're saying. I'm gonna slap you. So you react instinctively like an animal and you say, okay, I'm gonna slap you back. Then that escalates into a fight and one of them dies. Tragic. What have you gained? Nothing. Suppose instead you use alchemy, the Christ alchemy, and you turn the other cheek. Now what have you achieved? First of all, in order to do this, you have to have self-control and self-mastery. That means you control your feelings and your thoughts, which helps make you the master of your destiny. 
So what you do is you take this energy, this negative energy that was sent to you, but you don't send it back in a negative form, you actually turn it, you bless the person. You might say, maybe he had a bad day, so you give him the benefit of the doubt, and you send it back with a blessing. You forgive him, and you bless him, and you let it go. Now what you've done, you've taken this negative energy inside your alchemical space and transmuted it into love and sent it back as a blessing and light. The other person at first doesn't understand because they expect you to fight back. So now they're completely thrown off and you're sending back this blessing which helps erase from their mind the negative energy. What you've done is truly like a miracle. It's a small one, but it's still a miracle. You are thus an alchemist. When you're a Christian, a real true Christian, you're an alchemist. You change energy from bad to good. That's all it means. The alchemist takes charge and turns lead into gold, which means you turn darkness into light, you turn bad into good. You become a transformer, transforming one thing into another. All this process helps you become a master of the universe because now you have to take all energy projected onto you and no matter what color it has, no matter what nature it has, you transform it and you send it back into light. So as an alchemist, you transform darkness into light. This is all part of the transfiguration. That divinity has attributes. So the more that we attune and we live by those attributes, we live by those principles, we become higher beings. We actually raise our frequency. It's like a butterfly who starts from an embryo into a beautiful creature and flies with, with total ease and freedom. In the same way, we get liberated. We fly into freedom when we start living those principles, these this higher spiritual principles of peace, of love, of giving, of humility, of gratitude. When we stay within those principles, connecting constantly to those, to live up to the higher principles, which we are already, that is going to give us that transformation, just as the butterfly does. We would have to attune to the highest, the highest good. We would always have to be, if we enter a room and someone's ill, or we have an enter a room and people are commiserating about how god-awful things are, <laughs> then we have to stop that because we need to always envision the highest and best outcome for that person. Not what they are now, but the highest and best that they can be. That's going to re that requires practice because we so many ha have uh, negative self-talk and and don't realize it. I, I don't think that people have a tendency to separate themselves from the talk that goes on in their head. Mm -hmm. They think that is them. It's just the brain that has recorded all of that. It's the ego and it it talks it talks it talks its job is to compare I mean, the brain's doing what it's designed to do it's spatially comparing it's analyzing at all times but that's not who we are that's just dialogue that runs so we have to be aware of that axiom nine of quantum field psychology asked the question do each of us truly have a divine mission in life do we each serve a divine purpose during this life. And for each of us, what might that purpose be? And how do we discover it? Tesla stated, we must each have a high awareness of the mission and work to be done. Jean de Galzin continued, speaking of divine missions upon earth, each one of us has certain lessons we come to learn. So we all walk different paths. And each individual has an individual path. We're all unique. You can only have the exact same birth chart every 26,000 years, which means that people who are born today all have individual charts. They are born at different times in different conditions. They have different souls. Each has a different state of consciousness and each is unique. But we all have a common goal. There's only one race on the planet Earth. It's the human race, color, ethnicity, creed, it is all superficial. The human race has a mission, and that mission is to learn to get into the path that leads to eternal life. That's the most important goal by far. People often don't realize that. In most churches, they talk about it, 
but they don't give you the information about how to get there. They talk about it evasively at times and refer to it as a mystery. As far as I'm concerned, if this is a mystery, I'm gonna crack it. I wanna find out what it is. God gave me a brain and I can use it to figure it out. The mission is to find the path that leads to eternal life. That path involves training yourself. It involves changing your life. It involves letting go of the superficial. It involves so many things. This is where the Rosicrucian Fellowship comes into it to give you a method. A safe, progressive method that will not cause you or anyone else any harm. It shows you a true path to lead where you want to go. This takes time. It takes day-to-day -day repetition. It takes faithfulness in doing your exercises. It takes faithfulness in living your particular lifestyle. You have to eliminate from yourself the toxins, including physical, etheric, emotional, mental, and spiritual toxins. And this takes work, much diligence. Again, you must eliminate the superficial. Anything that is not helping you get to your goal, that has to be eliminated. Anything that blocks your path, you must figure out what it is and eliminate it and focus on the essential. That's part of the quest, part of your divine mission. Axiom 10 of quantum field psychology brings up the proposition of diogenesis. Is it possible that each of us is a divine being in embryo? This is one of the greatest secrets of life, that our purpose upon life is to evolve ourselves into that divinity. Tesla said that religions and philosophies teach Man can become the Christ, Buddha, and Zoroaster. Divine mind exists in all of us, which is not generally known. That's been a secret suppressed since time began because the powers that be don't want us to know that. If people know we're divine beings with divine power upon earth, who needs some enslaving government? Who would march off to war and kill other divine beings? Who would be so foolish? Only those who don't know the truth can be manipulated and deceived into being enslaved economically, militarily, and so forth. Christ said, we're all free. And the truth will make you free. That is absolutely true. Just that I use myself is, it's called Yoga Nidra. And it is to attune to the divine consciousness in the, call it the inner guru, call it the inner God, whatever you want to call it, God consciousness. And, and it's a guided meditation. I am presence within. Exactly. One. Each person is the soul. I am the presence within. But when I identify myself with my thought forms, I begin to create a separative self that, does, that has no existence. And that is the separation of, from the I am that I am to I am right and wrong, I'm successful, I'm failure. So everything that you say after I am is already pre-programmed that comes through the mind. So how to return to the source, I am that I am, that is the ultimate practice of yoga. That, that, is, that is the major teachings that I bring into the practice of Hatha Yoga as well as Nana Yoga. Axiom 11 of quantum field psychology asked the question, is it possible to really transform ourselves into more divine beings? Could it be that we can actually do a form of divine alchemy to transform who we are into divine entities? Jean de Galzin further stated, we need to explain more about divine alchemy. Everything that Christ came to bring us is truly alchemy. We are each an alchemist, whether we realize it or not. When I was younger, a young lad in France growing up, I had no clue what alchemy was, like most of us. We were all alchemists. We we're each a divine being in the making. We are literally gods in the making, in embryo. We are each creating different things at all times, and we each have divine faculties. To begin with, the mind is the instrument we now use to guide us, but it is very limited in its scope. It only sees things within the boundaries of reason and logic. This keeps us in a narrow channel of perception. We have to find a way to transcend reason into a state of intuition, 
to go to a higher level of consciousness, which can only be transcended with the heart. This is where the head and heart unite. The head and heart are to cooperate, not fight each other. They each use their talents inside us to bring us to this new level of intuition. At that higher level of intuition, it means tuition from within, or teaching from within, from that higher source. Learning to connect with the higher self, learning to connect with the spirit self, and getting wisdom directly from within, from part of ourselves at a higher level. At that level, we do the right thing. Not because we're afraid of being caught if doing the wrong thing, but we do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. And it creates positive and beneficial consequences for all. Another part of divine alchemy includes understanding the law of cause and effect. This is a universal law. This law applies if you send out positive versus negative thoughts, because thoughts are energy which transcend the physical brain. When you send them out, they affect many people and return to you often in a multiplied form. When you project negative thoughts, they act like a virus. They infect and infest the minds of people all around you. That energy reflects back to you and you get more infected. It becomes self-reinforcing and the infection spreads. It can affect entire populations of people, especially when the negativity is repeated often and strengthened with strong emotional energy. Now contrast this with sending out positive thoughts. You're then sending out good light energy. That energy will multiply and be returned to you and lift you up. Negative forces will take you to the ground, but positive forces will lift you to the heavens. When I was a child, I had many discussions about heaven and hell with my mother. We must understand there is no such thing as hell. We create heaven and hell ourselves. Everything created by the higher power by God is good, but we were given free will so we can learn that we are self-creative and gradually expand our state of consciousness. But then we broke the law because we didn't follow the rules. We didn't apply the proper principles. We failed to live right. We created a distortion. That distortion of thinking, feeling, and behaving creates pain and suffering in a product called hell. It is our fabrication. It has been used by many churches for centuries to enslave people's minds and control them. It's our own creation, and we buy into it from our delusions. In many ways, we are responsible for everything we do. We're going to have to answer at the end of the journey when we go in front of the big tribunal. We're going to have to say, what did I do with my thoughts? How did I use them? What did I do with my feelings? How did I use them? What did I do with my habits, my actions? How did I use them? We have to answer for every thought, emotion, and behavior we generate. On the other side, we're no longer in the ego, hiding behind the illusions we created when inside the physical body. We're within the spirit. We must review objectively what we did well in life and where we made errors. And we review all of these on all levels, including the mental, emotional, etheric, and physical. Immediately after death, and for about three and one half days, we pass through this panorama of life where we review our entire life in reverse, but we first review it objectively in a more detached mode. From there, we spend about one third of the number of years of our lives to review and sort out what we did during this incarnation. For example, if we live 90 years, we'll spend 30 years reviewing what we did in the physical world, the etheric world, the emotional world, and the mental world. And what we experience through the review is much more intense than what we experience in the physical body. When we are here in the physical world, the physical body is so dense, it is so slow. We have much less sensation of feelings. We have sub-sensation. The most sensation we get is our own pain. For example, if you hurt someone in the physical world, you will have to experience their pain in the world of spirit. You will feel it to a greatly intensified degree, so you will remember it forever. Plus, you will feel the pain that is attached to them through its effects on other people. It's like a pyramid effect or a chain reaction where reverberations spread outward in a vast sea of energy. The pain, the feelings attached to it, become stored in your conscience, your long-term sense of right and wrong. This is so you will not make the same mistakes during future incarnations. To take another example, suppose you tell a lie. The lie causes a person to be condemned and go to jail. 
and their family suffers. There's no one to support them. So a huge chain reaction results. When you come back to incarnation, you might have to live a life where you're in the victim's shoes to be falsely accused and suffer hugely from it. Because then you'll see for yourself the consequences of your actions. And because you've reviewed it through your panorama of life initially, through these eyes, your little voice within knows you can't fight it, that you have to accept the consequences of what you have created. You become the victim of what you have created so you can see the other side of the coin. This way we experience both sides. We can understand more deeply and be cured of our delusional thinking. These are very powerful lessons. The wheels of the gods grind exceedingly fine. There's another principle that helps us understand our transformations of self and consciousness through divine alchemy. That is the law of analogy. There are many great ones who are helping us, our invisible helpers, our brothers in spirit, angels and archangels, many great beings are on the other side trying to help us, coach us back into this higher life. Part of how they teach us wisdom is through analogy. In other words, they make comparisons between things so we can, in our concrete minds, understand abstract matters that would otherwise elude us. People begin to connect things together that would otherwise be missed. And we become more awake. We see more connections and more things make sense at deeper and deeper levels. This is part of what we aspire toward and go through on the path. The integration of many differentiated elements into a whole, into one. Peter, John, and James, it became a light being, a totally mm -hmm. spiritual being. Mm -hmm. He tells more about how, what he was doing. He simply, he was becoming his true self and showed his true self to them. Right, right. Actually, those are the, some of the events that more, proper, more properly illustrated that we can comprehend is I think actually it happened when Christ was on the cross. So when he was on the cross, just before the cross, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he was even saying that, my Lord, my Lord, why thou hast forsaken me? That means he was not fully connected to, to God, to Christ consciousness, but he got connected on the cross when he said, forgive those who do not understand. That means he removed the separation between him and his offenders because he saw the oneness because he entered into Christ's consciousness on the cross. And it's the, so that is my understanding. For that consciousness to awaken in you, that is the second coming. There's, I, I don't think there's any trumpets being heralded and, you know, that, and, but it is, it's the awakening of that consciousness. And once you find that for yourself, the world is never the same after that. So the point is, we're trying to bring a much higher level of awareness to all of mankind, to hopefully help the world in some small degree. If you realize there are a higher set of concepts now available to everyone, this can help people all over the world to help create a united world. We've had a culture of war, depressions, and death for many centuries now, for millennia. We hope to help usher in a culture of enlightenment where people all over the world wake up and realize we are all divine beings with a divine purpose on earth. We all have a mission on earth to fulfill. And part of that mission is to help people understand we're all divine beings. Tesla asked, what wine waters the thirsty so they can cheer in their hearts and understand they are gods? Axiom 12 of quantum field psychology involves mind math. There's a mathematics to how the mind works. Professor Michael Tischer stated that Dr. Ron's work shows parallels between mathematics, physics, and musical thought. In fact, his work can also be applied to breaking down international barriers, bringing peace and harmony to different cultures, peoples, languages, and systems of thought all around the world. Because it shows a commonality of thought energy and emotional energy of all these different prior systems. It truly is a huge step forward, a true bridge between science and spirituality, which can be used by different peoples and cultures and governments around the world to integrate and harmonize what's happening in the world 
to create a whole new world of peace. This theory has the power to truly transform the world, showing the bridge between science and spirituality, ending the conflicts, building harmony, and moving the world forward like never before. The mind is an energy field that transcends the physical brain. Thought is energy. Thought connects all minds together and to a higher mind, where W, or wavelength, equals KAP of 1 up to KAP of N, where the wavelength equals spatial frequency, or K, times A amplitude, times P, or phase. These are summed across many, many wavelengths to compose each thought dimension of mind. Dalrymple's law, first formulated in 1978, this is E of energy of the mind equals M, or the mass of the mind force, times F frequency squared, divided by the square root of 1 minus F squared over C squared. This means that as the frequency of consciousness approaches C, or the speed of light, or beyond that, the energy of the thought emotion field approaches infinity. And we are able to connect with divinity, which is divine infinity. GM, or the gravitational force of mind over time and space, equals 8 times pi times g times t divided by c to the fourth. The mind force each person generates has a specific effect on matter over time and space given by an equation that parallels Einstein's general theory of relativity. Recursive function theorem states that what we project forth in thought emotion and behavior returns to us in myriad forms. Manifold theory states that as we transform our experiences into light, we ascend through many octaves of divine consciousness. Mm -hmm.